I've already told you why me, because I'm a vet that has an interest in this disease. Where have I come from? I used to work in the veterinary teaching hospital at Sydney University. I don't anymore. I mainly live in the country. I organise continuing professional development for veterinarians. And I, I do a lot of horse work because I've got 42 horses. So it's interesting that one of the things is, is, is horses get neural angiostrongliosis, although less commonly than other species. And I'm told in Hawaii there are horses that have been affected. And Sue's laboratory head technician is running some CSF and central nervous system tissue from horses with their real time PCR to diagnose it. But I love horses, um, so I've got to show some pictures of them because I'm proud of it, because you need to understand what my life's like a bit. <laughs> Particularly this girl that's been pestering me all week in the laboratory. <laughs> and my partner, Andrea Harvey, is a cat specialist who's doing a PhD about Australian wild horses. So these are all what you guys would call Mustangs, but in Australia we call Brumbies. And I live in a high climate place, about the same altitude as Volcano, where I went walking the other day. And it occasionally, it snows about once a year, but like half a centimetre. But one year we had about 20 centimetres, and so I want to show you that because I <laughs> think it looks absolutely magnificent. This lady and I have wonderful rapport. I'm going to work on you all during the talk. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and as one of the other people said earlier, I've got people that like my talk so much they've come back for a second helping. <laughs> Is that right? Where, there you are, yeah, okay. So I, I also have goats. And goats are greatly um, undervalued animals as pets. And in Australia, of course, you know, we get a little bit of an intersection. So Gertie is the goat that sleeps on the porch at night. And this female kangaroo raises a joey each year in our front yard. And then she kicks out that one and has another one. So I just really like that photo of the goat saying, what are you guys doing here? It's my area. And I also breed miniature horses. So just so you know, I really love animals. So that this lady here that lost a litter of puppies, I understand what it's like to be upset by something. I should have never been a vet because I hate it when all my patients have a bad outcome. <laughs> the other thing that's important to do is to acknowledge as an outsider coming to your culture that some of the best work about this disease was done in Hawaii. And it, it's interesting, you can normally find out about people by um, Googling them and using Wikipedia and things like that. I find it hard, but Joseph Alicata was a medical parasitologist in Honolulu that did work on all of the parasitic diseases in Hawaii. And there's a monograph where he summarised every different parasitic disease that humans can get in Hawaii. And he predicted, based on his reading of the parasitology literature, that a hitherto uncharacterised disease of eosinophilic meningitis was likely caused by rat lungworm, and then proved it, and then did a whole lot of research. And this was all done in the late 60s and the early 1970s. Say again. Oh, no, sorry, for, sorry. Oh, no, sorry, somebody said something, no. Um, um, and so if somebody asks me, how long does it take from a dog to be infected with a thousand L1 larvae to develop disease, and I'll say 11 days, it's because Alicata and Indrik that he did work in did that experiment. They, once they found the disease in people, they then inoculated as many different species as they could to understand the disease. They didn't do horses, but they did rats and mice and guinea pigs and pigs and chickens and dogs um, to, to study the disease. So I just need to give a lot of credit. A lot of the classical early literature was all done in Hawaii. And so, for example, this is one of the papers of one of his colleagues, a Czechoslovakian guy whose name I have difficulty pronouncing, who, who studied um, the natural course of infection of a rat. And these are very meticulous experiments where you get 100 rats and you inoculate them all with a certain number of larvae, of infectious L3 larvae that you harvest from, from snails or other systems. And then you put them to sleep at set intervals and do very careful dissections and histopathological analyses and grind up the tissues and put them through a bayonet to measure the larvae. And it's, these are lovely classical parasitology um, experiments. And just, I thought I could make some money selling this as sort of like creative art, but this is the pathology in the lung of the rat. Everybody forgets the rat 
It's quite a debilitating disease to the rat because what happens is they have a, a mass of worms, 20 worms, 10 worms, a variable burden of male and female androstrongless campanensis living in the right ventricular outflow tract in the pulmonary arteries. And that provides a very large resistance to blood leaving the right ventricle. And you also end up with an eosinophilic pneumonia due to all of the excretory and cuticular products of the worms going into the pulmonary vascular circuit. So if you experimentally inoculate a rat with this disease, it has reduced exercise tolerance. It breathes faster than a normal rat. And this um, histopathology, this is all inside a pulmonary artery. You can see the red blood cells here. And these are worm profiles. Just beautiful pathology, but not beautiful for the rat. Now, when I gave this talk to other people, I didn't go through the life cycle because I was talking to scientists and vets. But so so I've got to because you've got to make sure the general public has absolutely this nailed. So let me go through it really simply, although I think it, everybody knows. Male and female worms, nematodes, live in the pulmonary arteries. They have sex. It's a lot of fun being there with a the heart. No, it's all right. Okay, I'm not. <laughs> they fertilise eggs. Their eggs embolise. They go out the pulmonary arteries and get stuck in the lung. The eggs hatch into L1 larvae. The L1 larvae get coughed up through the mucociliary escalator. In other words, if you've ever had a cold and you've got phlegm in your chest and you cough it up, they do that. Then they swallow that, so the L1 larvae go out in the rat's poo. Okay? Worms in the heart, sex, embolise eggs, coughed up, swallowed, all through the guts, in the poo. L1 larvae in the poo are infectious for mollusks. Snails and slugs like eating shit. Okay? Because vets are very coarse people, so we just don't use any other words. So the, the snails and slugs are attracted to the faeces that can turn the L1 larvae. The L1 larvae penetrate into the mollusk and they feed and they migrate and there are preferential distribution according to which species of snail and slug it is. And they molt. They're very tricky. They keep the cuticle even though they molt. Normally when you molt, you know, a snake molts, it gets rid of its skin. But they keep the cuticle, so they go from L1 to L2 and L2 to L3. And L3 has a double cuticular lining, okay, because it needs that. Because the next thing that happens is the snail containing L3s is eaten, and normally it's by a rat to complete the life cycle. Everybody with me? Yep. And the rat eats it and it goes down to the stomach, which is full of hydrochloric acid. And so the larvae are protected by the double layer of cuticle. And they zoom out of the stomach in the rat. They bury out. They produce some transient eosinophilic gastritis as they leave, which in dogs and people causes some vomiting and a little bit of diarrhoea, typically. And then in the rat, the thing that distinguishes this and makes it unique is the larvae go from the guts, portal circulation, liver, right side of the heart, lung, and find their way into the central nervous system. They have an obligatory migratory pathway through the central nervous system. Why? I don't know. It's a nice place, it's immunologically protected, it's got a good blood supply, but they have to spend time in the central nervous system. And then they undergo some more molts, and when they're big enough, they go in through blood vessels in the subarachnoid space and get into some venules and then find their way back in the lung. The trouble occurs when a non-rat eats the snails or slugs. Because the remarkable thing about the neural migration in the rat is it causes very little inflammation in the rat. 
but that's very different in everybody else. So if a dog or a human or a horse eats a mollusk, the migration of a larvae is, mimics what happens in the rat through the stomach wall, transient gastritis, portal circulation, liver, lungs, into the nervous system. But now it migrates through the nervous system and usually it causes a lot of damage because it isn't in its correct host and you get a lot of inflammation in the wrong host. And it's the inflammation in the nervous system that gives the encephalitic or meningitic forms of cerebral neural angiostrongliasis. So that's the hardest bit. And I did that for Sue, so if you fell asleep, it's all on her. Now I was in Laos and we went to a local market. And on the table were all of the features of the life cycle, all for sale. And that just sort of blows me away a bit. And I'm not, I'm not faking the diagram, that's just a stall in, in, in Laos. Everything you could get, including transport hosts. And I should have said that if there are a whole lot of animals that will eat a snail or a slug, like a frog will eat snails and slugs. In Thailand and Australia, a monitor lizard will eat snails or slugs. And therefore, there are other animals that can be infectious other than mollusks. So in Thailand, for example, freshwater crustacea, you know, little, um, what do you call them in America? We call them prawns, you call them shrimp, um, can, can be infectious. And which animal is infectious varies according to the sort of the biology of, of each geographical part. But we, we did a retrospective study of CSOF from Laos and found that they had that disease. And this is only just an oddity, but if you also go to Thailand, the apple snails are so important, are widely used to create facial cream. So for the very young, well-preserved veterinarian, I'm sure you were using snail. <laughs> and earlier today, this gentleman took me to his house. He lives in this amazing mansion in a somewhat undesirable part of town. You know, and it's like he's got running hot and cold everything. He's got a tractor, an excavator, 400 different species of palm tree. And so, you know, he showed me where you go to catch the semi slugs. A similar guy did the same thing in Thailand, except here's an apple snail. And they, they, they're promiscuous egg layers, quite big snails. Um, and the eggs are a lovely salmon colour. And this is an aquatic snail. And in places like Thailand and Laos and Vietnam, the rice paddies are full of these and the people just pick up the snails and they represent good nutrition. Just, you've got to cook it. If you don't cook it, it's a bad thing. Now, for those of you that are veterinarians or are dog owners, I thought I would go through the clinical features of a disease and the best way to do that is to show you some movies. See what happens when you palpate the back for pain. See how things like flinches? Now we're doing some hopping, but when we pick it up for hopping, Try, this is a dog that almost never bites. They're just a lovely dog. Ooh, almost lost my hand. And now it's got the shits and it'll walk off. Go on, do it, do it. So this is mild canine neural angiostrongliosis. And as intelligent observers, the main feature is pain. Walking wasn't too bad. It seems to walk quite well. It can reposition its legs. Its patellar reflexes are normal or normal to increased. The tail is often paralysed or weak or held down. And if you pull on the tail, you get a, quite an exaggerated pain response. Now, this is a very good candidate for treatment. We'll talk about treatment later, but this dog's going to do well. Even if you did nothing, maybe it would do well. But certainly with treatment, this dog's going to have a good outcome. Dog is much worse non-ambulatory paraparesis or paraplegia. With support, you can see it has some voluntary movement, but it's weak. Front legs, pretty good. Head, pretty good. Cranial nerves, fine. Mitotic reflexes, normal to increase. Tail, likely paralysed. Some voluntary movement, but doesn't know where the limbs are in space, and it's weak. Now, if you saw those signs in a five-year-old dachshund, you would think invertebral disc protrusion, probably. But all of these dogs are puppies. And puppies put anything in their mouth and swallow it, and they 
explore their environment with their mouth. So they're at great risk for neural angio strongmouth. Ten week old black Labrador. Now just watch and tell me what you think. Is it angio or is it something else? That's me when I was young and handsome. <laughs> 40 years ago, yeah. This dog has proprioceptive positioning deficits, doesn't quite know where its legs are in space. It should reposition the leg. Yeah, t tail's okay. No patellar reflex. Nothing. Has it got angio or something else? Come and be, be bold. Lisa. Lisa, what's the diagnosis? If it doesn't have angio and it's a young dog, it's got neurological disease, preferentially affecting the back leg. What about this boxer puppy, Lisa? This one's really happy. The other one looked like it had myalgia. This guy, it's really good, but you notice the leg is a hyperextended, right? They've got a bit of fibrous contracture. Doesn't have any patellar reflexes. Poor proprioceptive positioning. This is sent to me, the, the, the veterinarian's receptionist uh, owned the dog and it's taken with their iPhone, which is the way I get half my information these days. So what other disease do you get in young dogs? It's the big differential diagnosis for angio in a young dog. Yep, well, preferentially, usually. Everything's usually because there's an exception to every rule in clinics. Which vet school did you go to? <laughs> yeah, that would explain it. <laughs> this is the dog after treatment. Not quite normal, because can you see it bunny hops with its back legs? It shouldn't do that. So these last two dogs have neosporosis. Okay, so Neosporic caninum is an apicomplex complex in protozoan related to toxoplasma. So this dog's got protozoal disease of its quarter equina. And um, it's the big differential for this. And the distinguishing features, since you're the only vet here, why didn't you come last night with the other vets? Wasn't invited. Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> we only had four vets come. Yeah, it was devastating. No, it's all right. But, but it's just a really important distinction. Now, in my country, in Australia, probably there are equal numbers of both. The breed predilection is interesting. Angio occurs in all puppies. Um, neosporosis is very common in Labradors and Boxers and Greyhounds, and we don't know the reason for that. But the difference is really important because the cornerstone of treatment for rat lungworm disease is to dampen down the eosinophilic meningitis with glucocorticosteroids. And if you give glucocorticosteroids to a dog that has protozoal meningoencephalomyelitis, it actually will go really bad. And so I'm jumping ahead again, but sometimes we have an each way bet while we're waiting for for different tests and we're deciding what to do, we will treat with trimethoprim, sulfur, pyrimethamine, a very good triple combination for protozoal myelitis. And if I don't improve, we'll assume they've got angio and treat them, because not everybody can afford to do a CSF and MRI on their dog. But I just wanted to, to, to mention that you can't be sure it's got angio just by giving the dog a physical exam. But if you've seen it before, and particularly if you live in Hilo, it's much, you're much more likely to see this, but you need to be aware that there are other diseases that it can be as well too. Now, this I find really sad, because this is the, the animal that is affected most commonly by rat lung lung disease in Australia, and this is a beautiful bird called a tawny frog mouth. It's sort of owl-like, it's really more like a jay, but it's a animal that eats moths and mice and anything it can catch. It's predominantly nocturnal. So this is Derek Spielman, who's a friend. He was a zoo vet, a wildlife vet and a zoo vet that became a veterinary pathologist. So he doesn't work hard enough during the week. On his Sunday, he works as a wildlife vet. And he's just checking the bird all over. But the point with this bird is it's quadruparetic from rat lung worm disease. So you can see the head's working, wants to bite him, it knows what's happening, but can't move its wings, can't move its legs. So they obviously fall out of the trees and people pick them up and they bring them to a veterinarian. And um, 
It's just devastating because these birds actually make wonderful pets. I had one for two or three years and went back into the wild and it's just really, I, I have an empathy towards um, birds. I just think they're, they're wonderful. Everybody has an animal they like with, but I, I just find it really sad. And these animals probably have the greatest impact of rat lung worm disease in Australia. By and large, they do really badly with treatment. The trouble is, birds look big, but they're not, because they've got all these puffy feathers, and underneath there's a, a small bird that might weigh 500 grams. And their spinal cord is really thin, and their vertebral canal is thin, so the spinal cord is really thin, and it doesn't take many larvae causing cavitations and migrating through with florid eosinophil inflammation to just wipe it out. And that's why the disease is worse in babies than it is in adult people, and why it's worse in puppies than it is in adult dogs. Because if you have the same number of larvae, because most of them are going to eat, for example, one semi-slug, then the damage is going to be disproportionately worse if you've got a really small structure. And the big difference between animals and people, and nobody knows why, is the L3s have a predilection to the spinal cord, and especially the cauda equina, in most animals. So people, when they get angio, rarely present because they can't, you know, they're paralysed in, in the legs and they can move their arms. They normally have encephalitic signs and cranial nerve signs and hyperesthesia and a whole lot of stuff. But Alicata found in his classical experiments that in the dog, the distribution of larvae was very located within the spinal cord. And in most of the animals I'm going to talk about, including the tawny frogmouth, it's the same. So in that bird you could have seen, its head was pretty whiff, it was still trying to bite. Its eyes moved around, it had a blink reflex. But the wings and the legs didn't work. So, a bit of history. Um, there was an amazing husband and wife combination, Josephine and Ian Macaris. And this lady initially was a scientist that worked in the Walter and Eliza Hall doing research. And then she enrolled to do medicine at the University of um, Sydney, where she met her husband. And then World War II happened, and they both felt they wanted to do something for Australia in relation to World War II, so they both volunteered to work in the army. But instead of putting them in the fighting lines, they put them in the medical division. And there's a big problem in Australia in World War II. We spent a lot of time in the Japanese theatre of war, and they both did malaria research. And, and she was, did a whole lot of work showing which drugs people could take to stop them getting malaria. And so they promoted it all to, I think she ended up as a major or a captain at the end of the war. And then in about 1950, she just became a basic medical parasitologist and just because it was interesting, they didn't know it was a disease at that point in time. She studied the life cycle of what she thought was Angiostromulus cantonensis. Now I'm sort of jumping ahead, but she actually was working with Angiostromulus macariaceae because somebody else later found out that the Australia has a lower virulence organism that lives in its bush rats. So there's a cycle between bush rats and mollusks. And that very rarely, if at all, spills over into dogs and people. The life cycle's the same, so all of the work was really good. Um, this is the paper, as it appeared in the Australian Journal of Zoology, that she actually got a, a letter to Nature published because the novelty was the obligatory migration through the nervous system. So I just, she just was an ex extremely productive woman, and there were three generations of it, because her father was Bancroft, the guy that worked out what caused elephantiasis, you know, the disease where your, your limbs swell up. So there's actually three generations of, of parasitologists, and in Australia, if you do really good parasitology work, they give you the Bancroft Prize. So it's just a bit of history. And I won't dwell here, but, but this is one of Alec Harter's diagrams talking about how the African land snail moved around as a result 
of changes with the Japanese Imperial <coughs> Army, and he felt this was very important in causing the distribution of Angestrong with Catanensis. You can see how it, it's moved from where it started to Madagascar all the way through these areas and then lobbing into Brisbane. Some people believe that. Other people believe it's the movement of rats the most important thing. But for whatever reason, you end up with this distribution of a disease. So that's a map of the world. If it's got a little bit of red in it, there are areas where it occurs. If it's got a little red triangle, then disease is sporadic. So in Australia, we've got it, and I'll show the distribution later, but it's only sporadic. A couple of cases every year in people. But if you've got a green um, triangle, then it's like an emerging infectious disease with an outbreak. And of course, Hilo has got the biggest green triangle in the whole world. So that's why it's sort of um, interesting. But there are a couple of other interesting hotspot areas um, Cuba, Jamaica, Costa Rica are all affected. And people believe that the drug trade in America, people taking boats backwards and forwards with cocaine and hashish and all of the things as responsible for the introduction to the organism in places like New Orleans and the Florida Keys. And the distribution in America certainly involves the southern states but they're lucky they don't have a really terrific vector like the semi-slug that you have. So they have the potential to have disease, and they tend to have disease in zoos that tend to have a rat problem. But so far, they don't have it. So you've, you, you've got the best disease conditions in the world. This is an investigator in Brisbane in 1968 that found out that, that the spicules on... The, the bush rat angiostrongus are shorter and the anogenital reef distance is greater so that we have a low virulence form, as I said earlier. In 1971, this is the first report of human cases. And what it says down the bottom, so I couldn't find the paper because they, they haven't archived such an old paper and I couldn't get it from the library. Over an eight-year period in Queensland, um, Eight patients had eosinophilic meningitis, two in the last two years. These were all adults. Lettuce was involved in most of the cases, probably because it had a slug within it. And the case they found, the furthest case back, was in 1959. The funny thing about this, it was actually discovered in 1944 in Taiwan by the Japanese. And they wrote the paper in the Taiwanese Medical Journal but it's in Japanese, so nobody discovered it until people, the disease was better characterised. So it's sort of been discovered and rediscovered um, in different areas. But from an Australian perspective, this disease at this stage was only seen in Queensland, Brisbane and areas, adult people with an association of eating salad. But the next year, in 1972, this guy, Ken Mason, a veterinarian, started to see cases in dogs. So this is his first report, a brief, brief paper in the Australian Veterinary Journal of about 10 puppies. He did this, he, he was a relatively recent graduate building up his own practice and he just tripped over this. He had a really interest in, in veterinary neurology. So it was published in 1976, even though the work, the, the, the cases were actually seen in 1972. And then in 1987, he published his master's thesis where he put together 55 puppies that he saw in his clinic and some experimental puppies that he inoculated with colleagues at the University of Queensland. So 1970, some human cases, some pups affected, all in Queensland. Didn't know anything about it where I come from in New South Wales. In 1978, Ross McKenzie, who became a very famous veterinary pathologist knowledgeable about toxic plants and what they did to animals, wrote up this Bennett's wallaby that had hind limb paralysis. And he, when he did a post-mortem, was probably looking for trauma or something else, but found Anchestrong cantonensis larvae migrating through the spinal cord. Remember, again, animals has a predilection for the spinal cord. So, see the pattern? People and, and dogs, roughly at the same time, spilling over into wildlife. 
The first baby was affected in 1987 in Brisbane, and Paul Provlick, who I'll come back to later, was very important. So a young baby got it and died. And always there's much more emotion when young children or young dog, dogs that are affected. I got involved in, this paper came out about 1991, but the cases were first seen in 1989, when we saw cases, very typical cases in retrospect, but I just didn't know anything about the disease. And so we wrote that up, and that's David Church, who's now the head vet at the Royal Veterinary College in London, and, and, and I. We just were lucky to be um, in that place at that time. So from Brisbane in the 1970s to Sydney, about 20 years later, it moved about 1,200 kilometres. Now, that might have been a natural movement, or it might have been translocation of snails or rats, because there's a lot of fruit. Mangoes and bananas tend to be grown. Sugar cane tends to be grown. Brisbane and, you know, this area like um, Townsville is very much the same sort of climate that you have here in, in Hawaii, so it's a sugar cane um, um, area. And uh, Anjo started to be seen in dogs all in that area, but then it moved down. And currently it goes to Jarvis Bay, which is about there, about 200 kilometres south of Sydney. And they don't think it will go further because it's too cold and the snail doesn't cope well with that. In 1991, Dick Wright, who currently teaches equine anatomy, and, and Dick and I were colleagues at Sydney Uni before he we went up to Queensland, he saw in a couple of foals. Now since then, foals have been seen in North America as well too. Horses aren't commonly affected. But of course they graze at pasture, so it's very possible that they can become affected. He thought they were likely to have migrating Strongylus vulgaris affecting the spinal cord, but he sent the larvae off for identification, it was catanensis. And since then other horses have been seen in Australia. 1997, we start to see zoo animals are affected. And around the world zoos are often the first animals that the first place where animals are affected because it's really hard to keep a zoo pristine because the animals spill seed on the ground and they can't clean it up a hundred times during the day. And so it's very easy for rats to find some feed. And if you have rats in a zoo and snails, then you've got like a perfect storm for getting angio. So this is a little hopping rat here. But Damien Higgins, who's a colleague at Sydney Uni, and John Mackey, who's a very famous veterinary pathologist in private practice in Brisbane, saw in 1997. And then tamarins. Now, tamarins normally eat snails in the wild, but they're a highly intelligent sort of subhuman primate. And they explore their environment and pick up things and put them in their mouth and clean one another. And the zoo here in Hilo lost almost all of their tamarins about five or six years ago. So zoo animals are a very good sentinel um, for this particular disease. And then back to Sydney, flying foxes. Now, you don't have macrobats in Hawaii, but these are very beautiful, intelligent animals with big eyes that eat fruit. And so you can easily see they're sitting on their favourite fig tree and there's a slug going across, because there are a whole lot of arboreal slugs as well as terrestrial slugs, and accidentally gets infected. And the bats present because they fall out of a tree. They can't fly anymore and they can't roost properly. And so if somebody brings them into a veterinarian, and they get another disease that affects their nervous system called Lysivirus, bat Lysivirus, which is like a low viral rabies. And they're the two, they were looking for Lysivirus and by accident found Neurolangia strongly eyes. 2001, Pam Konechny, the lady up here, and Rogan Lee, who's a veterinary pathologist that works at Westmead, Rogan developed an ELISA that makes the diagnosis much more precise, not just relying on eosinophilic placidosis. And this is a, a human case. Now, I don't mean to make light of it, but us Australians tend to drink too much, typically beer. And when an adult in Australia gets angio, it's not from eating a semi-slug in a salad. It's because he's a young guy drinking too much beer at a party and somebody dares him to eat a slug. <laughs> right? And it, it can be very devastating. But beer, unfortunately, only has a small amount of alcohol. If it was vodka, maybe the slugs would be more incapacitated. But if you drink them with beer, it just takes them straight to the stomach. And luckily, this patient had quite a good outcome, probably because whatever slug he ate didn't have a heavy burden. But I'm just presenting the cases. I'm not leaving any out. I'm giving them to you in chronological order. And I don't discriminate whether it's which type of animal or human, just to see how the disease is evolving over time. 
So Paul and Melissa wrote up a theoretical paper on the spread of disease in 2001. Then Janine Barrett and Melissa and Paul wrote up some flying foxes this time in Brisbane. They should have got them in Brisbane first, but we got there first for some reason. And then I had an, another chance. There's this really good veterinarian, Julian, who joined the clinic. He was very keen to do specialist surgical training and looking for a research project. And there was a dog, and this is a lovely irony, called Lettuce. And I'm not making that, the dog was called Lettuce. And it came in to run over a hysterectomy to be spayed. And four days afterwards, it developed all of these weird neurological things. And we kept on thinking, what surgical complication occurs after a spay in a dog? Anyway, I, he eventually called me and I looked at it. And because I'd seen the disease before, I knew what it was. Because when you're a vet, if you've seen it before, your ability to have the right index of suspicion was much higher. So we collected CSF, had marked meningitis with eosinophils, but this time we, we did a bit of refinement. We sent the sample up to Rogan and showed there was a high teeter of anti angio antibody um, in the CSF. Now the disease in New South Wales has spilled over into tawny frog mouth and these beautiful um, yellow tailed black cockatoos. We call them the rainbird because that's especially for you, because usually they fly around just before it rains. They love eating acorns from pine trees. It's always devastating when beautiful birds get this disease. Then Julian started collecting the data from Sydney and Brisbane. And so this isn't that common disease. So these are the cases that we got over about three years. Sydney's a big city, four and a half billion people. But can you see, like, the distribution is very heterogeneous, there are no spatial clustering, there's no hot spot. So it's very sporadic. And later we did work that shows 10% of the snails in Sydney are PCR positive for angio, and it's very homogenous in its distribution. So 2010, another one of these cases where somebody um, swallowed a slug for a bear. This is published not in a medical journal, but in the Sydney Morning Herald, like the local paper. Sorry, it's just a really good review article on snakes by Peter Banks, who's a really good rat, not snakes, a really good rat guy. Then we published all of the cases that Julian saw during his masters from both Brisbane and Sydney. And this has very good information about the temporal pattern of the disease. Because in Australia, 90% of the cases occur April, May and June. Because that's when we usually get heavy rain and it's still a little bit warm. We don't get it in the hot, dry summer. We don't get it in the cool of the winter. In Sydney and Brisbane, it's very much an autumn disease, what you would call fall. And remember, our months are different to yours, so like it, it gets flipped around. 213 was a really bad year for Anjo in Sydney. This was a young lawyer going to a party on a buck's night. Of course, he had beer and he swallowed a snail with a dare. He was ventilated in a coma for about six months. And this is after 18 months of rehabilitation. And you can see he, he's, he's not going to be a really good lawyer. And in the same year, and quite by chance, about 400 metres away in the same suburb, two babies got neural angiostrongliasis. One died, one survived with severe <coughs> cerebral palsy-like neurological deficits afterwards. And um, this is the brain of the infant that died. And in Australia, when babies get sick, they do not spare any money to try to make them better. We have a public funded health system. And babies get Rolls Royce treatment. And they did everything for this kid, absolutely every, a whole lot of really powerful modern medical intensive care techniques. And nothing made any difference. And this is a larvae migrating over the cerebral hemispheres. Then again, John Mackey, who was this veterinary pathologist interested in the disease, found a case in the bat, but it was very interesting in two respects. First, it wasn't cavernensis. It was this our low virulence, one that goes in the bush rat. And the infection actually became patent. So the worms got all of the way back into the lungs and started making L1 larvae in the feces, and that's really unusual. Then a different parrot got it, gang gang cockatoos with bad outcomes. And then Derek, my colleague from the uni, published in, and he was, basically his theme was wildlife sentinel. So he talked about the tawny frog mouse that other people had seen, 
and also brush tail possums. And of course, the possums are fruit eating birds, so if I eat fruit, they'll have slugs on the fruit. And then Malcolm Jones and Madras, his PhD student, did a whole lot of more theoretical parasitology papers at the University of Queensland. We did a study in 2015 showing 10% of the snails in Sydney were positive, so the risk is everywhere. And then we did another study with this guy here, Michael Ward, who's an epidemiologist, fine-tuning and confirming the things that we found in, in the paper by Julian Lunn. David Spratt is our local expert on lungworm, and he wrote a paper summarising all of the lungworm in Australia, and especially angio. And um, then we wrote a great big review article with, with a whole lot of colleagues where vets and doctors and scientists all wrote this paper that's got thousands of, almost a thousand references. It's really definitive. And then Paul Provlick wrote up the early case that he, he, he spoke about briefly in 1997 and talked a little bit about the theory. And Catherine Wilkes, who was a vet, who became a public health expert, who then became an infectious disease doctor, presented three human cases at a veterinary meeting because I wanted the vets to hear what the disease was like in people. So that takes you up to the present date with a very Australian perspective of sporadic disease, much less common than you have in Hawaii, but emphasising how animal insights provide really important clues and cues uh, to understand the disease. So in terms of as a vet or a veterinary scientist, these are the things that we want. We want to have better diagnostic techniques. The thing is, if you're a doctor and your patient gets sick, as long as he's got the appropriate insurance cover, money is no object. We can do blood tests, an MRI scan, collect cerebrospinal fluid, test him for a whole lot of um, in blood and CSF for all of the viral meningitides that occur. We can do all of that stuff. The hard thing when you're a veterinarian is people have a certain financial limit. And for example, in Sydney, which is a better case scenario than in Hilo, if you want to collect cerebrospinal fluid from a dog, you might do some blood tests first just to check it's safe to anaesthetise it. You give it a general anaesthetic. You collect the cerebrospinal fluid. All of these things, you add $200 to the bill every time you, you do something. The lab charges you $200 to look at it. The lab sends it off to Rogue and Lee and to a place that does real-time PCR to look for nucleic acids that might confirm the diagnosis. Um, and then, because you might not be sure what it is, you might do an MRI just in case, and suddenly you've spent $4,000. So if you just collect CSF and send it to the laboratory, and you need to get it to the lab very quickly because CSF is very labile. It won't stand going from Hilo to Honolulu. All the cells um, fall apart. It's, it's expensive and it requires quite a lot of effort. So it's harder to, to do things. It would be so nice if we had um, a point of care rapid test, an immunochromatography test for some antigen or for antibodies or for something like a pregnancy test that could be done really simply. But so far, we don't have a test like that. And so people are developing different immunodiagnostics to try to do that. We definitely want to determine optimal strategies for management of clinical patients. And I'll, I'll come up to that in a minute. And most importantly, we want to prevent the disease. And then if you want some theoretical stuff, we want to model the disease and how it will spread in the future. So why don't we go through those things? Because I put the videos at the beginning, I won't go through it, but the disease is quite syndromic in the dog. The changes are relatively characteristic. Hyperesthesia is a really characteristic feature. The animals, with the benefit of hindsight, usually have been seen to vomit a couple of days before they got the neurological signs. Sometimes the pain is so severe that you think the dog is aggressive. You try to examine it and tries to bite you. And if it's a breed that tends to be aggressive, you put it down to that. But if it's a Labrador, you realise, hey, that's not right. Labradors don't, don't behave in that manner. So there are a whole lot of things like that. But remember this important differential diagnosis of neosporosis, if, if you're a veterinarian. And um, I checked 
with um, an extension veterinarian that works in Honolulu, and I know that you've got Neospora in Hawaii, its major economic impact is, of course, is about abortion in cattle. And in Australia, that causes about $250 million loss of production. So a lot of people are interested in neosporosis. I'm interested in the dogs. Most people are inter interested in the cattle. But they're the pictures of, of the animals. Um, I won't go through that. I've showed you those two videos. Pain is the feature, usually a combination of upper and lower motor neuron signs. Neosporosis, they tend to have flaccid paralysis in the back legs with neurogenic atrophy. Whereas this disease, the tail is dysfunctional, but the hind limbs tend to be a little bit hyperreflexive. Why are the back legs affected first? It's a really good scientific question. Why isn't that the case in people? I don't have the answer. But from all the pictures I've shown you of animals, can you see how the, the, the lower limbs are always affected first? So how do you diagnose it? Well, if you had a puppy that was affected and you wanted to get a better idea, if you collected peripheral blood and you put it through a special machine that does full hematological analysis, or that was done in the laboratory, usually peripheral eosinophilia is present. That's very helpful, and maybe that's all you need to do if everything else fits really nicely. But the trouble historically was that young puppies often get hookworms and roundworms when they're young, and they also cause peripheral eosinophilia, because that's when young dogs are exposed to metazoans and develop immunity. And, and, and roundworms in dogs are required transplacentally and through the milk, so puppies are often affected. So peripheral eosinophilia is, is helpful, but it can occur for other reasons. So normally if we want to nail the diagnosis, we need to collect cerebrospinal fluid. In, in, in people, they collect it from a lumbar tap, and they don't get anesthesia. In dogs, we tend to collect it from the cisterna magna, and we always anesthetise them. So it's a big deal, anesthetic, hold the head a certain way, put a needle in just over one of the most important parts of the brain, get the CSF. In badly affected cases, the CSF is turbid because it has, normally CSF is crystal clear like vodka, but in this case it's turbid. And then you send it to the laboratory, it needs to get there quickly, and it usually has lots of eosinophils as well as an increased cell count. And then you have the choice of either looking for antibodies directed against angio, or showing angio DNA is present using a real-time PCR. So that if you collected CSF and you happen to work in this area, sending it to Sue's lab for real-time PCR is by far and away the best confirmatory test. But your veterinarian still you know, needs to do a whole lot of things and you need to be able to pay for that testing. In the human situation, they always use neuroimaging. CT is very insensitive for diagnosing the changes that you see with migrating rat lungworm. Whereas MRI, particularly if you use a high field magnet 1.5 or 3 Tesla, usually shows punctate lesions. And sometimes you can actually see the worms producing a little serpentine lesion in the white matter of the nervous system. Um, so that's just CSF from lettuce, the dog that Julian Lund saw before it went to, to Rose and Lee. Just lovely eosinophils. This is showing a very high teeter of antibody in the CSF against Angiostrongus cantonensis. This is a post-mortem of the historical case just to show you the, the tendency for the quarter equina to have the larvae present. With the PCR that I have access to, it's positive about 30% of the time. It's really disappointing because you'd like it to be positive all of the time, but the trouble with this disease is the number of larvae is not great, and where they are in the nervous system determines how much nucleic acid is present. And the best place to collect it in animals would be from the lumbar space. It's just much more tricky and you get blood contamination. So you go through different stages where the CSF doesn't, isn't PCR positive or might not be antibody positive, but if you did it again five days later, it, it becomes positive. But that's probably only of interest to the doctors and the vets. Um, but just if you're on HELO and you really want to nail the diagnosis, real-time PCR in Sue's lab at 400 metres down the road is, is, is the best confirmatory test that we could use. This
this is a test, an antigen test, a point of care test, like a pregnancy kit, developed in China. And Sue's emailed the people and I've emailed the people and nobody will tell us what's happening. It would be a terrific test if it does the things it's supposed to do. I've shown you the wildlife pictures. This is the spinal cord of the tawny frog mouse. Very small. We're talking about, like from one side to the other is two millimetres. And this is the, the inflammation here with worm profiles present. Brush tail possum, hind limb paralysis, small spinal cord. It's not an endangered species, so they get euthanized. This is the cerebellum from the animal with marked meningeal involvement. And again, you can see the worm profiles that are there. And look at that. Wouldn't want to have that migrating through your brain. So, treatment. Okay, I understand it's very controversial in people. I don't want to get involved in the controversy in people. I want to tell you about how we treat dogs, where I feel really comfortable. And the nice thing was we had a, a good meeting last night with a small number of vets, and the people there actually had very good experience. So Alfred Mina was there, and he's seen a lot of cases, particularly from, from Puna, I'm told. If I'm mispronouncing these words, I'm sorry, I'm just a visitor. Um, but he, he sees the cases, he recognises all the features from the video. The most important thing to do at the moment, at the beginning when they come in, is put them on a drip so you have intravenous access. Give them intravenous corticosteroids, whether it's dexamethasone, methylprednisolone, prednisolone, probably doesn't make any difference. High doses of glucocorticosteroids. In 12 to 24 hours, they produce a marked improvement in the hyperesthesia and the pain. So that's really helpful. It makes it much easier to manage the dog. In the first earlier period, narcotic analgesia is very helpful. Morphine, methadone, buprenorphine, some strong opioid, because they're really uncomfortable and they're really in pain. And to keep a dog on fluids with some intravenous access, you know, all costs money. <coughs> After 24 to 48 hours, the dog is substantially better. And then we believe there's a benefit in killing the larvae. So there's two, two, two features with this disease. The larvae are going through the nervous system like this. If you look at them under the microscope, they're really very vigorous. And they're migrating and feeding as they go. And they're growing much bigger. They start out really small, two millimetres long, really thin. And they end up getting fat at about 12, 14 millimetres long. Right? So early on, if you can give glucocorticosteroids for 24 hours, dampen down the inflammation, make them feel much more comfortable, they normally walk better, kill the larvae, then they're going to fall apart, they're going to stop moving, they're going to release all of their foreign antigens. But hopefully, the dexamethasone and prednisolone, or whatever you've given, has prevented an exaggerated reaction. But if you can get them through the next 24 hours, then they just continue to get better. What sometimes happens in Australia is there are dogs walking around with subclinical angio. So what happened was they ate or crushed a snail, and they got a small number of larvae, and they're just a bit off. They might have vomited, they might have a bit of pain, but they're not all that bad and they've got a low burden of larvae. And then they're unlucky. It just happens to be that time of month where they get their heartworm preventative. And the heartworm preventative has something that suddenly kills the larvae. So you have a dog that's a bit off that suddenly turns into one of the videos that I showed you before. If you give those glucocorticosteroids, they usually do really well because the worms are already dead we just need to dampen down the inflammation. So it's really simple. We always give glucocorticosteroids. We use high doses. And then after 24 to 48 hours, we kill the worms. You can kill them slowly with fenbendazole. You can kill them quickly with moxidectin. You can kill them quickly with ivermectin. You can kill them quickly with milbamycin. I don't have shares in any drug company. Um, um, probably fenbendazole theoretically makes better because you need to give it every day for three to five days before it kills all of the worms and the slower kill 
probably is a more acceptable thing to do. But it's very easy to get a little bit of um, advocate multi and squirt it on their back and they absorb the moxidectin. So horses for courses, but, but we strongly believe that. There's something we discovered by accident quite recently. It's a vet called Michael Linton. It's a very good vet. He had a dog. He's had three now, but he had one. He couldn't decide whether it had angiostrongleosis or vertebral osteomyelitis, discospondylitis. So he couldn't decide whether it was a bacterial infection with bacteremia or angio. So he anesthetised the dog, took x-rays of its back, didn't see anything, collected CSF and did a blood culture. And the blood culture was a pure culture of E. coli. And since then we've seen that in a proportion of the animals. Now, this is called a... Sorry, this is just a graph showing the different size of the worms and why there's great benefit in killing the worms early before they become big. This is um, from Paul Provlick's paper. <laughs> just thought I'd throw that in for people interested in North Korea at the moment. But, but um, What happens with migrating worms in the gut is they're feeding in the intestine as they go along. They eat the protein present in extracellular fluid and blood and plasma and tissue. So while they're doing that, they also gobble up some bacteria. And the bacteria go through the intestinal tract and they get defecated out. So the, mark, the larvae, and this has been shown for a whole variety of metazone uh, uh, parasites, especially in chickens, and some strongyloides do, do, do this as well too. So these larvae are like Trojan horses. They eat some bacteria and they're going through them and then they go through the body and get in the nervous system and then they defecate them out. So it seems logical that we give antibiotics that have good coverage for the enterobacteriaceae as well as giving glucocorticosteroids and something to kill the larvae. Now, in Australia, we've been accidentally doing that a lot of the time because we were often treating for neospirosis while we waited for all of the results to come back. So we sort of had it covered accidentally for the wrong reason. But I think that's important. And there was a case re reported recently from Vietnam of a human patient with neural angiostrongliasis that was also blood culture with one of the enterobacteriaceae. Probably with a good immune system, it'll get it under control. But if you're going to give them a big dose of corticosteroids, I think it behoves you to have some gram-negative coverage. So. I'm getting tired and it's getting late, but we're really interested in the epidemiology and how it's going to change. At the moment, we know it extends um, all the way from the tropical north of Queensland down to Jarvis Bay. The coastal distribution is almost explained by the fact that Rattus ratus and Rattus norwegicus are very coastal. The bush rat lives west of the Great Dividing Range where my farm is. So where I am, you're not going to get angio. And I PCR'd every snail I can find and none are positive. So that's all good. But as my mother told me when I was a young kid, Richard, prevention is better than cure, she used to say. And in the dog, this is an incredibly preventable disease. Okay, because the larvae get into the dog and take 11 days before they be, develop clinical signs. So you have a big window of opportunity to kill them or to have an anthelmintic that will work. And there's one standout drug that is likely to be highly effective, and that's moxidectin. Now, ivermectin, does everybody know what ivermectin is? It was one of the first of the macrocytic lactones used. The guy won the Nobel Prize three years ago for work he did 20 years earlier. So it went from ivermectin to milbamycin, which is better than ivermectin and safer for a variety of reasons, and then selamectin, and then moxidectin. And moxidectin has a better therapeutic index, so it's a safer drug to use in collies and shelties. But its big benefit is it has very long pharmacokinetics. So it lasts about three weeks, a little bit longer in blood. Now, the product that you can buy, kosher, in other words, licensed for use in the dog, is called Advocate Multi. Vets sell it. It's really expensive. 
It's a product that prevents fleas and intestinal worms. But if you give that every three or four weeks, I'm not sure, the research hasn't been like done, I think very likely you will prevent any dog that does something when you're not around and crunches a, a semi-slug or a giant African snail or a frog. What do you call those croaky frogs or what do you call them? Crazy names, you Americans. <laughs> Whatever the dog eats, that whether it's a transport host or a definitive mollusk host, if it has effective levels of moxidectin, the larvae will die well before they ever get to the central nervous system. There is a product that you can use on licence that does that. So I really believe um, prevention is more important than cure. The best way I can convince you of that is to remind you that there is a disease in the United Kingdom and Europe called French heartworm, caused by Angiostrongus visorum. This is a disease in the dog, where the dog is the host for heartworm. So the dog gets the same signs that the rat do. So the, the dog can't exercise properly, it coughs, and it develops a hemorrhagic diaphysis, it has a bleeding tendency. So this is a big deal in the UK, particularly in Bristol and Wales, and heading up north, and in France and in Spain. And at the moment it's behaving like an emerging infectious disease. The reservoir host is probably the fox. So where fox, urban foxes and dogs overlap, they spread it. And they've done the research be, for, for that organism because it's so common and important. And they know that moxidectin, given at the set dose it's present in the licensed product, prevents dogs getting French heartworm. doesn't matter whether they eat slugs or snails or anything else. So conceptually, there's a proof of concept that's already occurred. The only way I can prove it to you guys, if we encourage everybody in Hilo to put their dogs on moxidectin, and we ask the vets how many cases they see, and we document a drop-off on cases. If you see your dog eating five semi-slugs in the food bowl, I would immediately race to the veterinary clinic to get some. But if you see it happen, ivermectin works really well. Milburn Ison works really well. Because if you know when they're infected and you treat them the next day, you'll kill all the larvae. The benefit of moxidectin is if you give it on the first day of every month, you'll have roughly stable levels dropping off towards the end of the month. So we get every three weeks or four weeks. But if I owned a dog, I would do that. I think I might stop there, because I think you'll ask questions that will then let me answer things that I would otherwise say. So what about, I stop the talk now, and that way people that want to leave can do that, and then people are interested can ask questions. Would that be all right? Journals from Asia and from the Caribbean, their advice when advising people yep. to avoid getting this is that essentially you should be treating surfaces that may have been exposed uh, through the slime trail yep. as if it were raw chicken. You must disinfect. They have a lot of children in Asia who enjoy playing with snails, even if they never eat one. Yes. But they advise. If your child plays with snails or slugs, if you are a gardener or a farm worker, disinfect your hands. Where they use catchment water, another big issue for us locally. Is there a question coming? Well, I, I, was, I was wanting to point out that the advice being given in the United States and Australia tends to focus on the host snail and slug. Mm -hmm. If you want to be safe, that doesn't seem to be enough. Those are the most concentrated source of nematodes. But without proper filtration of catchment water, and without taking in a wet environment, the slime trails seriously. Your own paper from 2012 that covered the data from, what was it, uh, 2002 to 2005, in the epidemiology section, it referenced that, oh, in the slime trail, you can find these but depending on the ambient conditions, it only lasts a few hours. Well, in our own Hawaiian studies, we found that in catchment, they live for several weeks. 
So assuming we never have a dog or a person to eat a snail, we still have a safety issue. So if we're talking about prevention, we I'm have to I'm keen for all dogs in Hilo, irrespective of what they do in life, to have moxidectin every month. I don't discriminate on their, their tendencies, because they're all at potential risk. Right, right. Okay, so look, I, we actually don't have any dis disagreement, right, but, right. But, but it's all good. Which heart will prevent it? So we mostly, most of the time, are infected. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But not... So you... you yeah. Stop, stop. One sec. So You're already paying a lot of money. Yeah, so we should... Pay a little bit more so you get the good stuff. Yeah, so just quit. Swap. Yeah. So... It's just big because, like, ivermectin's good for preventing heartworm, right. and it'll kill some roundworms. It's not very good for whipworms, not, not at the doses you use in, in, in half guard. HeartGuard was the original product, hasn't kept up with all of the others. But you still pay a fortune. Do you know the amount of ivermectin you get costs three cents in a $50 packet of HeartGuard? Mm -hmm. So pay a bit more to get stuff that got moxidectin. The very good vet that came last night, Alfred, said that in his experience, if people go to a vet and go on preventative with milbamycin, they're much less likely to get angio. But if milbamycin is better than ivermectin, then moxidectin will be even better. Can you use it on breeding animals? Um, as far as I know, you can. But, you know, I, 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 moxidectin is starting now to be used in human patients. Um, there are papers on the pharmacodynamics. There are papers about it used for onchocerciasis. Um, and it's going to be trialled as a better treatment for scabies than ivermectin because it has a sufficiently long duration of action. If you treat psychoptic mange in people, crusted scabies, you need to give two doses three weeks apart because the eggs hatch after two and a half weeks and so you need a long duration. So moxidectin is coming for people, but it will be coming to a developing nation. And I don't think you're quite qualified. But, 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 but for dogs, it's really easy. And if you own horses, the best horse wormer has moxidectin in it because it kills the insisted cyathostones. So you're, all, you're much better off, if you're going to use a macrocytic lactone as a wormer in a horse, moxidectin is much better than using ivermectin. You often alternate that with other drenches like benzimidazole. Is the slides available online? Or can you can have the talk. Yeah, you can have the talk, so we'll send it to you. If you, send, if you somehow find somebody's email, the only trouble is the embedded videos are really big, but you can have it. I've it'll given it to... It. It'll, it'll be up on our website on that long one, um, okay. And I'd be very happy if you want to talk to dog breeder groups or if the vet wants to give a talk to your colleagues or you want to show to... Them. It's just for everybody. Oh, I believe we have apple soil here. And they're uh, they live in the that's that, that an aquatic smell. Yep. But, like, apple snails, they're pretty tough. They've got a big muscular foot. They're a large snail. They're, like, there's good eating in them. Um, but they're not nearly as dense with larvae. And when they die, the larvae don't escape the way they do because they pull back into the, the shell. So apple snails are only a problem if some minority of people like escargot and don't cook it properly. It just like in the trouble with apple snails in Southeast Asia is people want to eat them. If they fed them to pigs and ate the pigs, it would be fine because pigs are very resistant to angio. But, but they, they want to eat them themselves. Albendazole, fenbendazole. Well, when we have a, an infection in a dog, we normally dampen down the inflammatory response with corticosteroids and then after 24 to 48 hours, kill the larvae. If you want to use fenbendazole, the trade name is often Panacure, you give 30 to 50 milligrams per kilogram every day for three to five days. If you only give it for one day, it doesn't work. So you get a really good kill. It kills all of the nematodes and also things like Giardia. It's a really good old-fashioned benzimidazole. It has a slow kill, likely to be highly effective. 
The only trouble is it's got terrible taste. In Australia, where you have liquid pedicure, in America, you can get it as tablets. But that works fine. If you want to stop your dog getting angio using pedicure, you'd have to give it like three days a week, every week forever. Yep. Perfect. And go for Fenbendazole? Perfect. Absolutely like, what do you do for a job? <laughs> I'd play the stock exchange. You're going to make a lot of money. You'd like, if any, like, I was hoping somebody would have a question. I just saw my dog eat a semi slug. What do I do? Okay. And as long as you give any highly effective antifilmetic, it will work. If you've got Fenbendazole tablets, get it every day for five days. No, it's all good. If you didn't have that and you had ivermectin, the heartworm tablet, that'll work too. The only trouble with ivermectin, it doesn't last long enough. 